Uh, next presentation is from Osha Zer. She's the um, Chief Technology Officer um, at Mako, uh, which is a hybrid seeds company in, in India, and her presentation is going to be on food security and the role of the private sector. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for making it in this room, even though it's raining out like cats and dogs. I was thinking about the rain, and I was um, always reminded how water, um, uh, either we have too much of it, and today I'm sure the Illinois farmers are not very happy with all the rain that is coming down today. And of course, in my part of the world, uh, there's not enough water. So I'm not a social scientist nor an ecologist, so I'm, I feel a little out of place in this particular session. But I hope to uh, give you a little perspective on what has happened in India over the last um, 50 plus years uh, in terms of food security and the role of the private sector. A little bit of information just to have everyone on the same page. Um, I know that the information is old news for many of you, but I see lots of young people and might be useful to think about what things were before Green Revolution and what has happened since. So as you can see in the left box um, was what the situation was in the 60s, the, the population of about 400 million people. As against that, our population today of close to 1.2 billion people. Hunger and starvation was um, across the country very prevalent. Uh, today we are food sufficient, but we still have significant prevalence of poverty and malnutrition. Uh, we had no food, so if food arrived on the ships, uh, the people had food to eat, whereas today we have bumper crops and um, have problems of storing the food. So productivity was a big challenge, and of course, Green Revolution had significant contribution to addressing this problem. And one major point, because of the a crisis that existed in the 60s, there was tremendous support from the policymakers, the politicians, and the public sector, which uh, I will discuss a little bit today as to how that stands today. And in the 60s, there was no private sector, just beginning to uh, have few companies. And today we have a situation, we have a very competitive marketplace uh, with 300 plus members just of the National Seed Association and of course others who, are, who may not be members. So what happened during the Green Revolution, and I won't spend too much time because others have already talked about it. So three, uh, three important uh, points to remember uh, as we go forward in my presentation. So we had the introduction of new genetics, which was the semi-dwarf varieties, uh, had disease tolerance, which responded well to fertilizer, irrigation, and uh, use of pesticides was also promoted um, uh, to ensure you had good agronomic practices. And the last point, which is very important, that this, this particular revolution was exclusively driven by the public sector. So policies were all aligned, politicians were all aligned, distribution was aligned, and there were really no hurdles uh, in a way to move this thing forward. If we look at what has happened since then, um, the high yielding varieties, of course, doubled the yields uh, for rice and wheat. We saw significant improvements in other crops uh, as uh, government and private foundations had significant programs to promote high yielding cultivation. We also have introduction of hybrids uh, in many, many crops, which led to productivity gains as one would expect. However, when we look at the seed replacement rate, which is an indication of uh, the adoption uh, and uh, penetration of the hybrids uh, or new varieties, we still see that the seed replacement rates in most crops, uh, especially the self-pollinated crops, remain very low, 30%, 35%. So we have significant opportunity for improving this where cultivation of improved uh, varieties or hybrids. And we have, of course, a lot of advances in terms of molecular biology, so molecular breeding. Uh, we have 
more um, opportunities to find native traits from wild relatives, uh, and we have GM technologies which are also at play. And more recently, an earlier speaker today uh, talked a little bit about that. How do we look at uh, the microbial uh, seed treatments and so forth to improve productivity? So, let's see. All right, my slides have. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, all the advances that we've seen in the past um, 40 years have led to what you see in these pictures here. Uh, abundance of grains, especially rice and wheat. Uh, if you drive through Haryana or Punjab in, during the harvest season, either for rice or wheat, you will see these uh, rows of trucks waiting to unload uh, the grain. And then the picture on the left that you see stacks and stacks of grain which are being sto stored um, and not being distributed, but stored. And so the challenge then becomes, every time you go to Delhi and talk about improving productivity, they said, well, the problem is not productivity, the problem is how do I get this grain out? Because everybody says that we have enough food. And uh, so this has a negative impact in terms of the government's ability to uh, put more money for research, uh, to really think forward and talk about producing more food, which is, of course, uh, what is required. So as we look at uh, the significant achievements that have been uh, from the Green Revolution and um, continued advances, uh, we still have growing population requiring more food and uh, varied uh, um, or diverse uh, type of food. And so we need to continue to look at how do we produce more in a sustainable manner. We still have uh, malnutrition and hunger. Um, so if we look at uh, real numbers, uh, we're looking at 200 plus million people who still go to bed hungry or are not getting the right quality of nutrition. Uh, sustainability, uh, one of the big uh, criticisms of Green Revolution uh, is that Green Revolution, while it improved productivity, uh, was not really a sustainable model, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Water, of course, is a critical resource, and in most of the country, uh, we really need to look at how do we increase productivity while addressing the water challenge. Um, urbanization is also eating into the land available for agriculture, so that uh, is another area for concern. Uh, the public sector-driven agenda, which was the Green Revolution, uh, now is in conflict to a certain extent with the private sector agenda. So it, it, to a certain extent, we are aligned that we want to provide um, good material for farmers for high yielding uh, uh, crops, uh, but the traits or the, um, or the types of materials that the private sector feels is required, the public sector always doesn't see the same uh, priority. And one example of this would be the labor uh, issue. So if we, in any crop that you see, uh, the private sector and the farmer, and I include the farmer as a private sector body because each farmer is trying to optimize their costs and uh, see how they can be the most profitable they can. Uh, anytime they want labor, they are not able to find labor uh, for whatever activities, whether it is weeding, whether it is harvesting, or if they find the labor, the cost of labor is very, very high. So the private sector would have an agenda as to how do we provide technologies which address this issue um, of um, uh, reducing labor requirement in cultivation. So be it weed control, be it um, better planting mechanization, harvesting, and so on and so forth. The public sector comes back on this particular issue and says, well, we are a population of 1.2 billion. How can we be short of labor? And so any time a proposal goes to the government to promote a technology uh, for weed control, they'll say, no, no, we don't. India doesn't need weed control technology. So we have a little bit of conflict now in terms of what the public sector research agenda is and the private sector research agenda. 
So the focus of the private sector and the public sector are different uh, in terms of crops, in terms of geographies, and where the private sector is more engaged. So what I would like to focus on during my presentation is to talk about how do we leverage our strengths uh, to uh, provide, um, have the best agriculture that is possible in the country. So while India is food sufficient um, and by and large we are in a position to buy if we are not producing whatever is required in the country, we still have significant imports, particularly in two commodities, oils and legumes. And uh, the earlier speaker talked about the vegetarian population, or if we had vegetarian diets, uh, we might have a different ecological footprint. Um, and in India, as it turns out, 50% of the population, or Ashok actually might have more accurate numbers, but is a vegetarian, and so legumes, uh, chickpeas, peas, uh, pigeon pea, is a very important component in the diet. And India produces, uh, has a lot of acreage under these crops, but the productivity of these crops in India is very, very low. So how do we uh, look at um, improving that uh, situation where we have better security in these uh, areas? We also have increased our soybean acreage in the country over the last few years, and uh, what we are finding is that while uh, the, the oil part of it is fine, but uh, the other uses of soybean are not culturally not present. And as a result, much of the soybean meal is getting exported. So in the process, we are exporting all that protein and also all the water which was required for cultivating that soybean. So what has happened in, in the private sector over the, uh, over the last 30 years is that uh, private sector is across the country and present in crops where we have uh, potential or opportunity for protecting our intellectual property. So that is, a, that is one of the driving forces whereby if you have a commercial model, then you will work in a particular crop. So maize, rice, wheat, um, wheat is a little early in the development in the private sector, but sorghum, millets, vegetables, cotton, sunflower, I could add number of crops, where crops could be hybridized. So even in the absence, absence of a legal framework, you still had a two-year advantage before somebody could take your product and copy it and sell it in the marketplace. So the focus of the private sector as a result has been in, on limited crops, and as you would see in the list, legumes are not included because uh, one, they could not be hybridized. Uh, we didn't have any mechanism, laws in place to protect those varieties. And what we have seen as a result now is that the productivity, uh, per acre productivity, in these crops where the private sector has been uh, present for last 15, 20, 30 years, is doubled in many cases compared to when we started versus the legumes where the private sector has not been present. And um, so this, this creates again a, a bit of a friction between the public sector agenda and the private sector agenda in terms of how do you uh, address food security while uh, the, the public sector doesn't have the same incentives or need uh, for accountability. I'm going to use cotton as an example, and uh, most of you in the room will say that it's not a food security crop, so maybe I should not be talking about it. But just for information here, cotton oil is the second largest oil consumed in India in the food chain. The cotton meal also goes for animal feed. So to say it's a fiber crop alone is actually inaccurate. Uh, cotton happens to be a very important crop in India, and because of one single technology, uh, which is insect, insect control, uh, BT cotton. Uh, cotton is the first crop where after the Green Revolution introduction of technology that we've seen doubling of yields in a particular crop in less than 10 years time frame. And uh, so I will uh, not talk about the technology or just uh, give you a brief uh, summary of what, is, what has this one technology done to the Indian cotton industry. So we've doubled our yields. India globally moved up um, from being number three cotton producer in the world to number two cotton producer in the world. Insecticide use has been reduced by 40%. Uh, we have um, 
adoption of this technology over 95 plus percent uh, acreage this year. Income went up for the farmer. Uh, almost six million smallholder farmers grew this technology. And when I say smallholder farmers, it's two hectares or less. That was the land holding of a average cotton producer. So earlier also, uh, David was talking about how the GM technology has been a scale neutral, and this is a true example uh, of that. So when we talk about sustainability, uh, looking at this technology, so I see three levels where you have a very distinct and clear impact because of BT cotton. So you have impact at farm level, so in terms of pesticide use, in terms of the energy, and in terms of the, in terms of the residues. Um, so the pictures here depict what a typical farmer does for controlling insects in their field. And if you look at it, you see that the exposure to pesticide, the way the pesticide is handled, the way the pesticide is sprayed, the farmer has tremendous exposure to all the chemicals that are being used. The farmers have seen a uh, rise in incomes uh, because of doubling of yields and uh, the prices uh, fortunately have been pretty stable. And at the national level, uh, India used to be a net importer of cotton, so we've gone uh, to be a net exporter of cotton. Commodity prices have uh, stabilized and of course the consumer even though the consumers uh, may not realize it directly, but consumer has benefited uh, tremendously. Uh, what has happened as a result of this increased yield, as well as uh, the labor shortage that I was talking about, is the requirement that the uh, farmers have now of trying to look at uh, alternatives to manually picking cotton, which is the, which is the norm at the moment in India. So, uh, Earlier, again, one of the speakers was talking about how we change the plant architecture. Uh, and in this case, because of the labor requirement, labor shortage, as well as uh, improved productivity, the farmers are now demanding that the plant type be changed so it's easier to harvest by machine than have to go and do manual picking. So I won't go into the types that are required, but just to show how because of the technological intervention, the plant type anyway had changed, but now the requirement for additional changes to the plant morphology, which will make it more enable, enable it to be uh, more uh, mechanization friendly. Uh, here's a picture of um, a farming family of 10 people who typically grow brinjal or eggplant as a crop. You might be wondering what that 74 number is on the picture. 74 is the number of times uh, eggplant cultivator in West Bengal sprays their crop to control one insect pest, which is the brinjal fruit and shoot borer. 74 times for a 150 day old crop, which means that the farmer has to spray the crop every other day for them to be able to control the insect. Now, when we talk about sustainability, and uh, food production, and some have argued in India that uh, eggplant being a vegetable is not relevant for food security. I differ, but that is one of the arguments. But how can we not look at technologies which allow us uh, to address a problem of this magnitude? 74 is, of course, a very high number, uh, which is uh, prevalent in the eastern part of the country, but across the country, an average farmer would spray about 27 times. So the pesticide residues which remain on the fruit, um, you can imagine what that would do. So we have developed a BT uh, eggplant. Uh, brinjal is the Indian uh, word or Indian term for eggplant. Um, and of course, uh, as you would expect, we have a reduction of pesticide use on the trial plots that have been uh, grown, uh, we have higher marketable yield, because in case of eggplant, it's not that you lose yield, but you have damaged fruits which are not acceptable in the marketplace, so you increase the marketable yield impact and of course a monetary gain for the farmer. So interestingly, and here's the dilemma, uh, that the public sector, private sector research component uh, comes into play. Um, the BT cotton technology and the BT eggplant technology have all uh, and other technologies which are in pipeline, 95% or more of them come from the private sector. The public sector has not been able to introduce 
any GM technologies in India, which creates uh, tension and possible hurdles uh, for technology from the private sector to move forward uh, for the benefit of the farmer. Uh, Bangladesh, our neighbor, who also has uh, participated in this public-private partnership that um, involved Bangladesh, Philippines, and other public sector institutes in India, has taken a decision to move forward because the Indian government, uh, the apex body for biosafety clearance, has cleared the product, but then the political decision not to move it forward for commercialization until further something, uh, is still pending in India, but Bangladesh has gone ahead and commercialized it. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the region would know that the Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh and India have a common border, and our borders are pretty porous. So sooner or later, we are going to see this material start to move into India, just like BT Cotton did. BT Cotton didn't come to India um, because of legal deregulation to start with, it was the illegal cultivation which then prompted the government to go ahead and actually approve the product. Uh, so we have um, the partners in the BT uh, Brinjal, the ABSP2 consortium, uh, where the public sector partners will take forward uh, technologies uh, for pro-poor pharma, the same technology whereas the private sector would work on continue to work on their high yielding varieties and hybrids. I have a number of examples of how technologies are available uh, and I will go through them relatively quickly. Uh, here's an example of salinity and drought. Salinity uh, is um, uh, in a way an impact of the Green Revolution in part of Punjab and Haryana where excessive irrigation has led to a situation where the groundwater is no longer suitable uh, for use uh, for irrigation because of high salt levels. So the farmers will only plant crops once the canal waters uh, are released, which are fresh water. And so if anything we can do for both the chronic salinity as well as the acute coastal salinity, uh, we would be able to impact yields in case of rice and of course other crops as well. So here's an example of how um, uh, products are being developed uh, on the bottom left panel, as you can see, number of different entries which have either gone through molecular breeding approaches or GM approaches to try and address uh, salinity and drought. Uh, the transgenic events and salinity tolerance, as you'd see on the right, uh, by the number of tillers that you see in rice in the salt conditions, saline watered conditions, are much higher than the ones which uh, don't have the tolerance uh, gene in them. Uh, very briefly, one of the things that we're moving forward with extensively is molecular breeding approaches and how do we apply high throughput um, uh, automation for this uh, technology so our costs come down and the time it requires for product development um, uh, reduces in terms of a final product, but in this particular case, an example of rice, where rice is all transplanted, so if we can provide a molecular a genetic fingerprint of which rice plants actually should be transplanted to the commercial field or to our research field helps the breeders in making the choices of which would have the elite set of traits or characters that they're looking for. So this is one of the opportunity areas where the private sector who has made significant advances in India in these technologies can work with the public sector for crops which the private sector is not interested in but has the opportunity to provide either as a collaborative project on let's say chickpea for example, and I will show you some examples of that. So how do we le leverage our complementary skills? Um, the private sector brings a lot of commercial expertise, um, uh, but we do need uh, the pro public sector to continue to build capacity in terms of providing us plant breeders, pathologists, entomologists, and so forth which we don't do, and our extension services, if you ask five people in the country or 50 people in the country, I think every, every person will have a different opinion about what the Indian Extension Service does. And so this uh, is a challenge and an opportunity in terms of how do we leverage uh, the capacity because we have a large workforce in the extension services in terms of agriculture officers and how do we get, this, get those to 
uh, work together. The molecular breeding, I was also mentioning. GM crops is another example where we can have uh, very strong partnerships for developing uh, traits and technologies in pigeon pea and chickpea, two very important crops where India spends um, billions of dollars importing these from other places. So chickpea has an insect problem which can very easily be addressed with BT and that is an, a collaborative project that we actually have going on with Assam Agriculture University and hope that this product will come to the market in the coming three years. Uh, similarly, uh, talking about sustainability and which traits actually will have a greater impact. So nitrogen use efficiency is one such example where we have introduced a gene uh, in rice uh, for improving nitrogen use uh, efficiency. And as you can see in the picture, uh, the preliminary results show that the biomass has increased and the biomass translates, uh, in this case, has translated into higher yields. And if we uh, apply 30% less nitrogen or maintain the same level of nitrogen, then you'll either get the same level of yields that you have today or increase yields and, of course, have a positive uh, impact on the greenhouse gas emission if you have reduced nitrogen application. Uh, and this is after harvest and it's much more clearly visible the number of tillers that you have in the rice plants and how that translates into final yield. So the opportunity that we have is that the private sector is focused on, narrowly focused in some ways, on few crops. Uh, the public sector, of course, continues to work on the other crops uh, that are very, very important for the country. So how do we, how can we leverage this uh, for overall impact in Indian agriculture? Green Revolution doubled production of the two main crops, rice and wheat. Uh, BT cotton has been another example now where one technology has led to doubling of yields. But we really need to be talking about uh, how do we create this doubling effect in other crops which we are not having a conversation on. We are talking about an incremental increase, one trade at a time. And we really need, maybe need to think about how do you do a quantum jump in some of the more, uh, some of the other important crops. Our pipeline is very strong. Uh, we do, I uh, don't feel that we are lacking for technologies or know-how. It's a question of having the right environment, facilitating environment which allows us uh, to actually take these technologies forward. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first is you mentioned the improved safety of people working and also consuming the crops uh, with these improvements. So I wanted to know whether in addition to the, the way you can develop the crops to be more safe, if there are any initiatives or focus in the public and private sector about farmer safety and consumer safety from the point, uh, from the perspective of applying pesticides and those kinds of things. And then also if you could talk just a little bit more about what that labor shortage problem is coming from. So the chemicals which are sold in the country uh, all have come with a safety label in terms of how, uh, what should be the safety norms that the farmers should practice and the, um, the salesperson or the shops which sell the chemicals also recommend to the farmers and in many cases provide gear for them to wear, aware, have gloves on, have shoes on, have the maybe a white coat on and so forth. But looking at the practical um, nature or practical uh, situation that exists on the farm, uh, when the cotton requires spraying, we are looking at um, a temperature which is in the excess of 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or more. We have uh, significant humidity. Uh, the farmers are not practicing what is being given to them, what is being told uh, to them. So the extension services actually can play a big role there to further promote that, but that is not happening. Now, interestingly, once, once the farmers started adopting BT cotton, there were some socioeconomic studies done to see uh, how often did the farmer make a visit to a health clinic for uh, various uh, illnesses. And a significant reduction in visits to the health clinics was seen in farmers in India as well as in China. 
Uh, so whether one, one can attribute that directly to the reduction in pesticides used on the farm uh, is, uh, is a positive impact of the technology. On the labor shortage uh, front, um, is, so the problem is similar across the world, uh, that youth don't want to work on the farm. Uh, the farm is not being remunerative enough for them to stay on the farm. Uh, Ashok may highlight some more things in his talk about this, uh, but so these are some of the challenges. Then, in addition to that, the opportunity for the youth to be engaged in other work than farming have also opened up. So whether it is retail, whether it is um, moving to the city, they're getting a little more education, they're moving to other jobs. And so as a result, what we are seeing now is farmer, uh, the labor migration from either Bihar or Rajasthan going to some of the states uh, like Gujarat and Maharashtra. And um, the local labor, labor requirement is very, very short. G to give you an example, when the cotton picking starts, the initial rate may be seven rupees per kilo of cotton picked. But by the time you come uh, to the fourth, third picking, second picking, it'll already be at 15 rupees per kilo. And by the time you come to the third picking, last year, the farmers in Gujarat were telling the labor that whatever you pick, you can keep half. So that is the extent of the labor shortage that we are seeing. Other questions? Illinois. <clears throat> <clears throat>